This is section 1.8a, composite functions. First, let's do a quick review of function notation. You may have seen this in Algebra 2, but um, just in case you forgot it or in case you didn't learn it in Algebra 2, we're going to quickly go through it now. Um, and for today's explanation, we're going to use these functions as examples um, for most of it. Uh, we're going to use as our example f of x, the, the function square root 2x plus 5. And uh, its domain is 0, infinity, or the interval from 0 to infinity, including the endpoint 0. Our sample g of x is the function negative x cubed plus 4x squared. And that function's domain is negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, so on to function notation. Um, one way to write the operation of adding a function, one function to another, is uh, parentheses f plus g x. And that's completely equivalent to f of x plus g of x. Now, um, f of x plus g of x, in this specific case, is simply adding our g of x, which is negative x cubed plus 4 squared. We're adding that to our f of x, which is square root 2x plus 5. And so we end up with this, root 2x plus 5 minus x cubed plus 4 squared. Notice that all we did is uh, we added g of x to f of x. Now, what is the domain of this function, which is a combination of f of x and g of x uh, added together. This new function, root 2x plus 5 minus x cubed plus 4x squared, what is its domain? All right, I'm going to um, ask you to pause the video, think about that for a second, then resume when you have an answer. You should have come up with this. The domain is the interval from 0 to infinity. Because just as, um, just as for our f of x function, we see that the domain is 0 infinity. And the reason um, for those limitations is because, you know, we can't have uh, anything lower than 0 under the radical. Uh, well, that same limitation applies to this combined function, f of x plus g of x, because um, one of its terms contains a radical, and um, the x's that we pick in a domain the x's that make up a domain, have to work for every term in the function. And that's why our domain is 0 to infinity. f minus gx is the same as f of x minus g of x. And um, I'd like you to pause the video again. And this time, this time, uh, come up with what f of x minus g of x is, and also come up with the domain and then resume when you have answers for that. Okay, so you should have come up with this. Um, f of x minus g of x is simply square root 2x plus 5 minus the function negative x cubed plus 4 squared. And when you distribute that negative sign, you get positive x cubed and negative 4x squared. And so this is what you end up with. This is simply f of x minus g of x. And that domain is still the interval 0 to infinity because we're limited by that 2x that's under the radical. fgx is the same as f of x times g of x. And uh, if we multiply f of x by g of x, you see that f of x is um, a binomial, right? A binomial has two terms. First term, root 2x, second term, 5. And g of x is a binomial first term negative x cubed, second term 4x squared. And you know from Algebra 1 that when you're multiplying two binomials, you can use the FOIL method, first, outside, inside, last. So just as a quick Algebra 1 drill, do that on your own, and then resume when you have um, the, the multiplied polynomial um, of f of x times g of x, and when you also have the domain. All right, so uh, this is what you should have come up with for your polynomial. You may not have a re uh, rearranged the terms or simplified like I did, but uh, you'll see that it comes out the same. And uh, this is just what happens when you apply the FOIL method. Uh, 
first, outside, inside, last, uh, to f of x times g of x. And you end up with this polynomial, which is um, the, the functions multiplied. And it's just 4x squared minus x cubed times root 2x minus 5x cubed plus 20x squared. And the domain that you should have come up with is also 0 to infinity. Now, don't worry, we're not going to end up with the same domain for every single example uh, in this lesson. It just so happens that this domain works for the first three. Okay, next, um, f over g x is the same as f of x over g of x, uh, f of x divided by g of x. And so now, um, just write f of x over g of x, and you have what this combined function looks like. So. Um, I'd like you to pause the video, do that, and come up with the domain, the domain this time, but remember that the domain is going to be different for this. And let's see if you can figure out why. So um, pause the video and do that, and then resume. So you should have had this, root 2x plus 5 over negative x cubed plus 4x squared. We just wrote f of x over g of x. The domain is where it gets a tiny bit tricky, because this is our domain. Now, if you figured that out on your own, congratulations, that's great. If you didn't, don't worry. We're going to be spending a lot of time on domain and range, and I can spend time explaining it in class uh, over and over again if necessary, because um, in order to do well in calculus, you need to understand domain and range. And uh, some of you might still feel shaky on it, but don't worry, by the end of this course, you're going to be experts on domain and range. All right, so let's look at why we got this domain. Um, if we look at the numerator, okay, um, remember how we ask ourselves a negative question when we're trying to find domains. Um, what can't work for x, or what can x not be? Okay, that's our negative question. What can't x be? Well, looking at my numerator, I know that x can't be negative. Okay, so that's one restriction on my domain. I'm no, I know I'm dealing with um, numbers that are zero or greater, but now I have a further restriction imposed on me by the denominator, and I have to ask myself, all right, looking at the denominator, what can't x be? What can't x be? Well, I know, I know that um, when I have a denominator, I can never have a denominator of zero. Okay, we know we can't have a denominator of zero. Um, and so I have to ask myself, all right, well, what x, if I plug it in, would give me a, a denominator of zero? And if I find that x, I know that that x cannot be part of the domain. Okay, so when you set negative x cubed plus 4x squared equal to zero, you will quickly find that um, there are two possible answers. There are two possible answers. Plugging 0 in for x would give me negative 0 cubed plus 4 times 0 squared, and that, of course, is just 0. So I know that 0 cannot be in the domain. And plugging 4 in for x, plugging 4 in for x would also give me uh, negative 4 cubed, which is negative 64, plus 4 times 4 squared, which is 4 times 16. It's negative 64 plus 64, and that's just 0. And so plugging 4 in for x would give me 0 in the denominator, and that's also bad. Right, so 4 cannot be part of the domain. And that's why this domain, as you can see here, is um, really very similar to the domains we found for the first three examples uh, from, from 0 to infinity, with two further restrictions. Uh, it cannot include 0, and that's why you can see here where I'm circling that um, I have a parenthesis before the 0, indicating that 0 is not part of the domain, as opposed to the bracket uh, the bracket before the zero would indicate that zero is part of the domain. Okay, so I've got that, and then I have it going up to four, but notice not including four. That's why I have the parentheses. So four is not included. And then the union symbol, the union symbol when we're um, putting two sets together. That can also be read or, by the way. You can read that U, uh, which stands for union. You can read that as or. Um, and then we have uh, the next part of the domain, which is from 4 to positive infinity. Notice again that I am not including 4 because 4 would give me 0 in the denominator, and that's no good. 
All right, so that is our domain for this function. Now we're going to get into composite functions, and composite functions get a little bit tricky. Um, a little bit tricky. They are a little hard to get used to at first uh, because one function is inside of another. Okay, um, so the notation for it is it looks it looks kind of like an O. You know, of course it's not an O, but this symbol here that looks like an O, uh, F O G, if you like, X is the same as f of g of x. Okay, so notice how I read a composite function. The way that I read it is important because it starts to give us clues about how composite functions work. Okay, so what I'm circling now with the mouse arrow, right, is read f of g of x. f of g of x. Okay, that's a composite function. And don't worry if you're like confused by that because pretty soon you're going to see how composite functions work. I'm just introducing the notation for now. So if we do a, a, a composite function here with these specific functions that we're using to demonstrate the f of x and g of x at the top of the screen, well f of g of x is simply using g of x as the x that we plug into f of x. Okay, so notice how if I look at this whole thing, I've got the radical, and underneath the radical I have 2 times the quantity, negative x cubed plus 4x squared. Well, that quantity in parentheses is what we're plugging into f of x as if it were just an x. Okay, because this is a composite. This is a composite. Instead of plugging in um, just a number, I'm plugging in what is the result of another function and I'm plugging th that in as my input. Okay, so the best thing to do um, for now when we're starting out with composite functions is just spend some time looking at this. Okay, you're just look at what I'm circling now. Look at what I'm circling now. The radical with 2 times quantity negative x cubed plus 4x squared plus 5. And notice how that is really exactly the same thing as putting g of x into f of x instead of simply putting x into f of x. Okay? Putting simple x into f of x is putting any number into f of x. But now this is a composite. We are putting in g of x into f. Then g of x is acting as that input. Okay, and you can see it if you uh, just, you know, take the time to look at f of x and then look at f of g of x, you'll see the similarity. And you'll see that the only difference between f of x and f of g of x is that instead of putting x into f, we're putting g of x into f. All right, now, <clears throat> I'd like to draw your attention to this domain. All right, this domain of the composite, this domain of the composite, the domain is from negative infinity to 4, and it also includes 4. It also includes 4. Um, now, what I'd like to show you on the next screen is going to be how we got this domain. So I'm going to get to that, but before I show you how we got that domain, it's very important for you to write down uh, the following rule. The domain of a composite function is every x in the domain of the inner function whose output is in the domain of the outer function. Okay, now that sounds like a mouthful, but it's actually, um, it's actually easier than it sounds. Okay, so the domain of composite function, I'm talking about f of g of x in this specific case, is every x in the domain of the inner function, okay, in this case my inner function is g of x because g of x is inside f. So g of x is my inner function. So any element in the domain of the inner function, in this case g of x, whose output, okay, and, and, and that means that if I plug that x into the inner function, I'm going to get a certain output. And that output has to be in the domain of the outer function. 
Okay, so let's look at this specific case. Um, the domain of f of g of x is my composite. It's going to be every x in the domain of the inner function. Okay, the inner function is g of x, and looking at the top of the screen, I see that the domain of g of x is all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, so it's going to be the subset of all real numbers whose output is in the domain of the outer function. Okay, so that means that um, I can plug in all real numbers into g of x, but the problem is I need to make sure that whatever value results from plugging in that x into g of x will give me a value that's in the domain of f because otherwise it's simply not going to work. All right, now if I look, if I look here at um, this f of g of x, and I'm going to circle that in red, let's look closely at this f of g of x. All right, if I in turn look only at my inner function, well, my inner function is g of x. That's here. Well, that domain of the inner function is all real numbers. But notice that if I plug in some numbers here, I might end up with I might end up with a negative in the radical, and that's something I have to avoid. Okay, so the numbers that may be valid, valid parts of the domain of this inner function, not all of them are going to work because they may result in numbers that are not part of the domain of the outer function. Okay, that's exactly what this rule means. The domain of a composite function is every x in the domain of the inner function whose output is in the domain of the outer function. All right, on the next screen, I'm going to go through that process, and um, then we'll go through some other examples as well to make this a little more clear. f of x equals root 2x plus 5. We're going to use that same f of x. Domain 0 and infinity. g of x equals negative x cubed plus 4x squared. Domain all real numbers. Okay, now let's go back to um, what we did in the previous screen. And I want to show you how we got that domain. All right, so um, this is a bunch of stuff, but I'll go through it step by step. Okay, so f of g of x equals square root 2 times quantity negative x cubed plus 4 squared plus 5. Okay, that is my composite function. That is my f of g of x. All right, the next step is I need to ask myself the question about the domain. Okay, I, I know that the domain of this composite function is going to be any x that's part of the domain of the inner function. And notice that I'm circling the inner function whose result, whose output, will be in the domain of the outer function. And therefore, I know that I have to find all the x such that I do not end up with a negative in the radical. OK, so then um, let's go through the process of finding out which x's um, will not give me a negative in the radical. To do that, you need to set up an inequality. Okay, so I have negative x cubed plus 4x squared is greater than or equal to 0. I know that that has to be true in order for um, me to get a valid domain. Because if that's not true, then I'm going to have negatives under the radical. Okay, so here's my basic inequality that has to be set up. Negative x cubed plus 4x squared is greater than or equal to 0. Next step, we factor out the x squared. So x squared. Uh, times the quantity 4 minus x is greater than or equal to 0. Next step is we have to break this up into its two possibilities. Okay, now notice that I have one number times another. And you recall from Algebra 1 that um, a positive times a positive gives you a positive. A negative times a negative also gives you a positive. So the only two options that will work in trying to find this domain is that both x squared and 4 minus x have to be positive, or both x squared and 4 minus x have to be negative. And that is expressed in um, this next line. The set x squared greater than or equal to 0 and 4 minus x greater than or equal to 0, or the set uh, 
x squared less than or equal to 0 and 4 minus x less than or equal to 0. Okay, that's how we break this up. And, um, and then it actually becomes easier after that because I know that um, x squared greater than or equal to 0 is always true of every x. And so um, I don't need to worry about that. 4 minus x is greater than or equal to 0. Um, uh, I know that that is only true for certain x's. And then notice that I don't have to do anything with this side because, um, because for x squared to be less than or equal to 0 um, and for minus x to be less than or equal to 0, um, it's impossible for those both to be true at the same time. Um, because, like, you know that x squared can't be negative, right? Um, because anything squared is never negative. But x squared can be 0 only if x is 0. But notice that if I put in 0 for x here, I get 4 minus 0, and 4 is obviously not less than or equal to 0, and therefore I can throw this whole right branch out because I know that there will be no x's that satisfy it. Okay, so now I'm left with the uh, one and only condition that has to be met, and that is 4 minus x must be greater than or equal to 0. Next step, negative x is greater than or equal to negative 4, and finally, this is something not to forget, which you've learned before, but it's easy to forget. When you're dividing inequalities by negatives, you have to switch the sign. Okay, so we end up with x is less than or equal to 4, and that is my domain, and that domain in interval notation is um, parentheses negative infinity, comma, 4, bracket. All right, let's look at this example, g of f of x g of f of x. Um, so for practice, I'd like you to pause the video, write g of f of x, g of f of x, and um, don't worry about finding the domain just yet. I'll go through that. But just try to write g of f of x, and then resume when you have that written. All right, so this is what you should have come up with. g of f of x equals negative quantity square root 2x plus 5 cubed plus 4 times quantity square root 2x plus 5 squared. Now notice what we did here. We just, we just uh, looked at our, you know, our outer function is g of x. But what we're going to plug into g of x instead of just regular x, we're plugging in f of x and f of x is root 2x plus 5. And so wherever x would go, right, wherever x would go into g of x, we're putting instead f of x. And that's why in these parentheses, in those places where x would go, I have instead f of x, which is root 2x plus 5. All right, so you should have been able to do that on your own. Now, let's look at the, let's look at the domain together. We need to ask ourselves, is a composite domain Okay, so um, that composite domain consists of every x in the domain of the inner function. Okay, now my inner function here is root 2x plus 5 in that domain, which I'm circling now at the top of the screen. That domain is bracket 0, comma, infinity, numbers from 0 to infinity. And so I know that that's going to be a restriction on, on my domain, but then I have to uh, further... Um, examine whether every result, everything I might end up with in these parentheses, will that work in the outer function? And the answer is yes, because no matter what is in these parentheses, um, g of x will always work, because there are no limitations on it. And therefore, I end up with the same domain as my inner function. Now, don't think that the domain of composite functions is always the same as the domain of the inner function. Um, that clearly was, was untrue in the last example, where the domain of the inner function, g of x, was all real numbers, and the domain of the composite was much more restricted than that. Um, was, but, but just keep in mind that um, the, the domain that is more restricted, the domain that is narrower, is going to limit the domain of the composite function. Now we're going to talk about f of f of x. And uh, I know that looks funny 
because how can you do a function of itself? But it actually works the same way as other composite functions. So um, just take a stab at this, pause the video, uh, try to come up with f of f of x and write it out and try to come up with a domain as well and then resume when you have your answers. So f of f of x works on the same principle as any other composite function. Instead of plugging in that regular old x, you're actually plugging in f of x. So f of x goes into itself, so to speak, and you see that reflected here. Um, you see how the form of f of x is square root 2 x plus 5. Well, instead of that x now, we're using root 2 x plus 5. Um, and so what we have there is the composite function f of f of x. Now, um, the domain, as you probably figured out, is really only restricted by that, uh, that the radical. And see, if you restrict the domain correctly for the inner radical, you've automatically restricted it correctly for the outer radical. Okay, so the first thing you have to look at is what is the domain of the inner function? Well, the domain of the inner function is bracket zero, comma, infinity, right? And um, then you have to see, well, uh, does every number in that domain give me a result that also is in the domain of the outer function? And that is also true. Okay, so the domain here is simply bracket zero comma infinity or better said from zero to infinity including the endpoint zero. Finally g of g of x looks like gog right um, it's not an O but it looks like one so you can call it gog if you want um, anyway g of g of x uh, is also a function that's looks funny because it's like putting a function into itself but using what you've learned um, pause the video do this on your own and then resume when you have an answer so g of g of x is instead of plugging in x into g you're plugging in g of x and so here's what we have negative and everything in the parentheses is now substituting for x and we're substituting g of x for x so we have negative, negative x cubed plus 4x squared cubed plus 4, negative x cubed plus 4x squared squared. And that is g of g of x. And um, this, finding the domain here is pretty easy, right? Because we really have no restrictions whatsoever. Um, the domain of the inner function, it's all real numbers. And that gives you, um, those, you know, all real numbers give you results that work. Uh, for the entire domain of g of x. So the domain of g of g of x, or gog x if you like, is all real numbers from negative infinity to positive infinity. Okay, now um, we're going to look at an example of where finding the domain is a little bit trickier and we'll use these specific functions f of x equals square root x plus 7 and uh, the domain of that function is um, bracket negative 7 infinity uh, g of x equals 1 over x squared and the domain of that function is negative infinity to 0 union 0 to infinity which basically means all real numbers except 0 because 0 is the only thing that will give us an undefined result all right, so the first question is, what is g of f of x? How do you write g of f of x? Um, pause the video, do that, and then resume when you have it written. g of f of x equals 1 over square root x plus 7 squared. OK, see how we're just putting that root x plus 7 in for x um, when we're you know plugging something into g. And so we have 1 over root x plus 7 squared. Now we can simplify 1 over root x plus 7 squared to look like this. 1 over x plus 7. So that would be the simplified form of g of f of x. The next question is what's the domain of g of f of x? And um, this is where 
you have to be careful because what most people do is their first reaction is they simply look at the simplified form which I'm circling now. They look at the simplified form they say oh 1 over x plus 7 uh, the only number that doesn't work for that is negative 7 and therefore the domain's all real number is 7 negative 7. No! That is a trap. Okay that is a trap so don't fall into that trap. What you want to do is you want to look at the unsimplified composite function which I'm now circling with the arrow because the unsimplified composite function will give you clues as to how to restrict your domain because remember you're still asking yourself the same question. Um, you still have to find the numbers that are in the domain of the inner function whose results are in the domain of the outer function. Alright, so we know that we're being restricted by our inner function. Our inner function is f of x. And if my inner function is f of x, I have to look at its domain. Its domain is uh, all real numbers greater than or equal to negative 7. Alright, now then I have to look at each member of that domain and see if there are any members of that domain which will give me a result that is not in the domain of the outer function and it turns out that there is one alright because if I just look at that inner function and I see that that domain is all real numbers greater than or equal to negative seven um, I can't just write that because what happens is negative seven itself will not work for the outer function will not work for the outer function because it gives me a result it gives me a result that is not in the domain of the outer function okay what happens if I put in negative seven alright I put in negative seven and I'm circling here where I put it in okay I'm just putting in negative seven for x and I'm putting in negative seven because negative seven is part of the domain of the inner function but when I put in negative seven in for that x. Look at the result that I get for the function root x plus 7. I get 0. All right, and then 0 squared is 0, and that is bad because 0 is not in the domain of the uh, outer function g of x. 0 is not in the domain of the outer function g of x. Therefore, What's my final answer? The domain is all real numbers greater than negative 7. Not greater than or equal to, but greater than negative 7. And I had to throw out the negative 7 because I followed the correct steps. And therefore, this domain that I'm now circling, this final answer, is all the members of the domain of the inner function that produce a result which is in the domain of the outer function. Okay, so I know that finding domains of composite functions can be a little bit tricky at first, but like all things in math, um, you get used to it with practice. The classwork, page 89, write these numbers down please, and um, we'll work on them in class.